welcome to episode one of the visionaries only podcast presented by energy 11 hosted by jay thomas and we got linda Starr, singer songwriter and this is a great episode because she really delves into what it takes to be an independent artist in this day and age and i think that's an interesting plight because artists today have to be social media managers they have to be uh, business people they have to really try to carve out a niche for themselves in what might be the most oversaturated industry in the world and i think the way that she talks about sort of like the ebbs and flows of being an indie artist is super interesting and i think it's helpful for just entrepreneurs and creatives in general so you know i hope you enjoy the episode and don't forget to like and subscribe uh, subscribing to the platform is really really helpful for me beyond what i can probably tell you in the next minute and i want to get you to the episode so without further ado this is episode one of the visionaries only podcast we've got linda star i'm jay thomas enjoy i want to start with your name right linda star mm -hmm. and i know you under your government name um but i'm always interested when people uh create these stage names right what went into your thought process around creating a separation between you, Udalin, mm -hmm. and Linda Starr? You know what? Because um, I actually developed the name in high school. So senior year of high school, uh, because when I was you know, recording like different demos and stuff, I would always like do like a little tag and say like Udalin, but like it didn't like it didn't feel right. And mm. One day, I remember just like just you know like writing in my journal and just doing like crazy things that us teenagers didn't see <laughs> or hear. But yeah. it just came to me, and it was just that it was a declaration because we were graduating, and I was like, okay, I need I need to differentiate myself. I was like, this is a new chapter. Like, like back then, I was such a visionary, hence. You know, mm. it's very fitting nice. um, because nice. I always saw myself as like, I always saw like my higher self and like my, mm. like my best self. Mm. And I came up with a declaration where, you know, like a star that shines so brightly in the sky could never be overshadowed by a cloud. So the name mm. derives from essentially Udlin the star. So Lynn the star. <laughs> yep. You know, it, it took me a while to catch that. It, it took me a while because I was reading it as Linda. Yeah. And as I started to learn more, I, I started to understand. And I, I immediately when I really made the, the the distinction between the names and like how it's connected to your actual name, I started thinking of um, Beyonce and Sasha Fierce. And mm. when I saw you at Essence Fest, um, I felt like I was watching Yudelin, who I've known for, you know, over a decade. But I'm curious from your perspective, like before you get on stage, is there a distinction between Linda coming into her own on stage versus Udalin? Or are they one and the same? Um, I feel like they're one and the same. But mm. as far as Linda Starr goes, is like, like that's like my highest self. Like no matter what obstacles or what, whatever tribulations I'm facing, like, as you learn, like, you know, in within like my daily living, whoever yep. I am, like in that moment, like all of that doesn't matter. Like what matters is how I'm being of service, you know, to the people around me. And also, you know, how I'm utilizing this God given gift in the best way possible. So I know it's sometimes it's like an identity crisis, <laughs> but <laughs> I feel like, you know, when when I'm on stage, like I'm just like my best self. Like I I don't feel any insecurities. I'm not nervous. Mm -hmm. Like I'm like I'm freer. So it's yeah. essentially like my like my greatest self. Got you. Yeah. And when I watched you on Essence, you it it seemed like you were very comfortable. You know, when I've watched like you know like The Voice or like American Idol or something like that. 
um, I've I've watched so many of those shows. You can kind of hear like in like the first like couple uh, notes, like when someone's like voice is cracking because they're nervous or like you're, it's slightly the pitch is like slightly off. Yeah. I, when I watched your performance at Essence, I felt like um, and maybe my ears aren't trained, but I thought you did amazing and you absolutely killed it. And obviously the judges felt so as well. Um, Thank you. When I watched that, I, w- I think maybe I, I was even taken aback at how comfortable you look on stage. And I'm curious, like, when was there was there a particular performance that maybe you were like, oh, no, this is this is where I'm supposed to be. And then you started feeling that comfort. You know what? Um, Earlier in the year, so right before Essence, I uh, I performed at Apollo, so Apollo's Amateur Night. Mm -hmm. And it was that same energy where, well, it it was different because I, I felt like I was being prepared for that moment. So I was being prepared for Essence through the Apollo. Mm. And and I say this because at the Apollo, you know, it's it's an iconic stage, you know, all the greats have performed, like Jackson Five, Aretha Franklin, like everyone that you can think of has has graced that stage. So I remember during rehearsal, during the sound check, it was like something just came over me and it was like a reassurance that like I was meant to be here. Like even mm. um before they they called me when we were in the green room. Like I walked around and I was just like, wow, like I'm literally meant to be here. So mm. I, essentially like I carry like that energy to essence because um, a lot of people don't know this, but in 2013, like I was a freelancer. So I was working Essence Fest and I was you know, at the, uh, the different, uh, like the, I was at the Superdome. I was, I did some like ushering, um, responsibilities. I was media at one point. So it was like a full circle moment where it's like, okay, like I'm here, but I'm like, I'm on the stage. I'm doing like what I've been called to do. So that's, that's where the comfort came from, where I was just like, okay, like it felt, it felt like home. Like the stage Mm. is literally my home. Like no matter what stage it is, like the stage is literally like my home. It's my safe place. It's my, it's it's my like, it's just my place to just be free. So, yeah, that's interesting that you feel that level of comfort in maybe the like loneliest space, right? Where it's you're by yourself on this stage, yeah, and it's it's you. And you, right? Like it's literally just you on that stage. Yeah. And I think about that when <clears throat> I think about like how comfortable like some you see like some comedians are in front of an audience of like thousands trying to make people laugh. Yeah. Right. Like you think about that. I'm thinking and, about Gerard, uh, what's his name? Gerard Carmichael at the <laughs> Golden Globes, how he just oh sat down God. and made everybody uncomfortable. But yeah. <laughs> Oh man, I didn't, you know what? I didn't watch it yet. I didn't watch it. Gerard's one of my favorite comedians ever. And the minute I they said, hey, you're going to do the Golden Globes. I was like, this dude is going to make this night terrible for some people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, I, I was also telling you that I, I, I listened to your entire public catalog. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you. Because it was an absolute pleasure to listen to. And I, and I mean that sincerely because, um, I, I have like distinct memories of hearing you in high school. Right. But to hear you polished on my title playlist, right. Is a different experience. And it was so, I I, like, it's a super fulfilling feeling to, to see somebody, you know, doing like super high quality work. So I just wanted to, you know, shout you out by saying um, the work is sensational. Like it's truly, truly great work. Um, I'm I'm gonna tell you who I got hints of when I was listening to you, and tell me if you've okay. gotten this person before. I got hints of Jasmine Sullivan. I've yep, I've gotten that before, <laughs> and I'm honored. Like that's yeah. truly, truly, truly an honor. I actually I saw her perform at um, Essence Fest as well Mm. and she vocally she is in like the upper echelon of just like vocal beasts like undeniable her brandy 
um, Beyonce, like, you know, Celine Dion, like Aretha, Whitney, like they all like for me have inspired me like tremendously. Mary J. Blige, but I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to let you keep going. <laughs> so, no. <laughs> no, 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 yes. please. No, 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 please. This is conversational. I want, you know, f- feel free. But um, you mentioned Beyonce. I'm going to take a quick detour on on what I was going to ask you because you mentioned Beyonce. Mm-hmm. And I, you're somebody that is classically trained. Yes. And you do this for real. Can you tell me maybe from, I, I, am, a, I am a layman's in music, right? Mm-hmm. I have heard too much Beyonce slander around her not be, saying she can't sing, she's mm-hmm. not great vocally. For somebody who is classically c- trained, can you explain to a layman why Beyonce is so great at what she does? Um, yeah, so Beyonce is literally great at what she does because you can hear the time and an effort and passion that she puts into every single note, every single note. And not a lot of people can do what she does. Like not even just from like an entertainer standpoint, but like the breath control, the timbre, which is like the, the richness of her voice, her tone, even like her runs is just like, it's not like some people would say like, Oh, like she's doing too much or whatever. But I'm like, it it flows effortlessly and not a lot of people can do that, which is why I feel like a lot of people are saying like, Oh, like she can't do this. She can't do that. It's because they can't do it. They can't do it. And she has her own unique way of doing something. Even when she does covers, like I remember she did, um, she did a Lauryn Hill song, and she just made it her own. And I think she also sang a Coldplay song on, on one of her tours. And it's like mm-hmm. every song that she does is like she puts her essence into it. And yeah. like I said, with the breath control, like she's been trained since she was like, what, like four or five with like Matthew and like literally running on the treadmill singing. Not a lot of people can do that. That's so insane. her, her... Her vocal range is undeniable. She can go really, really low. I mm. think um, in her early days, she she did like a lot of like operatics, and I think some of that, um, some of those elements were in um, her self titled the Beyonce album. Um, but it's like, especially when like when she first came out, you could hear like the operatic, so you can hear her training as well. So yeah. I feel like all those people that are just slandering her saying like oh she's doing too much or whatever i'm like she's one of the most like skilled vocalists like of all time and i stand like that's the hill i'm gonna stand (laughs) yeah i i saw beyonce live and i saw her sing halo Mm -hmm. and not a flex at all but i was in a beehive oh yeah I, i i i I, I feel like between Dangerously in Love and B-Day, I was definitely part of the Beehive because I was studying her every single day. I watched all the videos. <laughs> I knew every yeah. single move. Even to this day, if you play Crazy in Love and like literally like, and I'm there, like I will do the full like choreography. <laughs> <laughs> it's insane. I feel like now, I don't know, people feel like they like worship her. I'm just like, okay, that. Yeah. yeah, y'all could keep they that. Got a little too far. I, I admire. Yeah. I, I respect her so much. Yeah, and I listen. I to to see her up close sing Halo, and l- l- she the thing that's that's really impressive about her. I think it's impressive for somebody to be able to sing, but to be able to sing pretty effortlessly to make it yeah. look like you just like it just oozes out of you is a different different level of skill yeah um but i wanted to get back to you because there was a there's a song there's a few songs i wanted to to, um to touch on um legacy in particular off Mm -hmm. of uh recovery and discovery right you know every single part of me might as well give you the rest of me we got some Uh, 
first of all, phenomenal song. Thank you. You know what song you reminded me of immediately? And I, I really hope you know this song. And I know <laughs> you, know, you know all you know a ton of R and B. So there's no chance you don't know this song. Yeah, I'm, I'm a walking jukebox, literally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> immediately, it reminded me one of my favorite Ari Lennox songs, "Chicago Boy." Oh man. Um. See, listen, baby. I know that I'm slowing up. It's fine. Oh God, I'm butchering. <laughs> Okay, I, I def- okay. Forgive me, y'all. I love Ari Lennox, but I think yeah, I'm 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 new. I'm still new to Ari Lennox. Forgive me, because gotcha. I know she had like di- other projects before Shea Butter Baby. But for me, Shea Butter yeah. Baby onward, like yes. But yeah. I will definitely <laughs> Chicago Boy. But go ahead, Chicago Boy. It's the first track on Shea Butter Baby. It's a great track, and it's talking about a guy that um that she wants to deal with um. And it's the way she's talking about it, like the effortlessness of the way she's talking about it reminded me of it. Um, where did you come, where did that song really originate from Legacy? Because it's a great track. Thank you. So um, Leg- Legacy originated from two things. From one, me having an interesting crush on a comedian. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not gonna no, like it's so crazy because no one will ever know who I'm talking about unless mm-hmm. you like really dig into like the context clues. Cause I literally like drop like little nuggets in there. But I digress. Okay. Um nice. so okay. that's a little that's, that's a little uh scavenger hunt for, for anybody listening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's insane how just like I was randomly just like writing just like my feelings after I like I saw them like at a show and I was just like, I need to just get my feelings out. And literally like everyone's just like, Oh my goodness, like you like I felt this. I'm like, Yeah, because I care for them a lot. But so that was the first part. The the second part, um, where I got the inf- inspiration from was the movie Queen and Slim. Literally, I was watching Queen and Slim and that scene where they're in the car. And Queen, like, she's just, like, she literally, like, puts her hand out the window. And she's, like, the the cinematography in that film was so beautiful. That scene alone just, like, captured me completely. So when I got home, I was like, okay, let me just, like, step into the character of Queen. Like, what was she feeling in that moment when she was around Slim and... And I just wanted to capture that moment. So those yeah. those are the two main things that inspired Legacy. Queen of Slim was a great film, and I, I now that you mentioned that, I can see where you got the the inspiration from the movie because there, they, that movie did a great job of 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 letting that love sort of like mature on camera, so it felt super right. authentic. Um, so I can see how you got you got from that. Yeah. Um, uh, one one of the things that I I thought about too when I was listening to Recovery and Discovery, which is um, your EP. If anyone's listening, you should um, you should g- definitely give it a listen. Yes, please. <laughs> please. Um, and I saw you mention this on on another show, but I thought about this before you mentioned it on the show. Was it feels like I'm listening to your diary, and I <clears throat> I always wonder with artists, like how much is too much. You know, and do you ever, f- does it, does it feel like you're exposed, right? When you're putting this music out here, something so incredibly personal to you, is there any hesitation on your part when you're thinking about putting this out into the world, knowing just how deeply this music hits for you? You know, I feel like that's the job of being an artist you have to be vulnerable. You have to, it, it, it may, f- it may feel scary, but like you're literally like putting your heart like on the line. And for me at a very young age, like I accepted that because I started writing songs when I was what, like eight years old. So I was already <laughs> like writing in my diary and, and I also like there was like an inner acceptance where 
I was like, okay, if I'm going to do this, like I'm going to have to understand that it's not just my story. And, and with, with artistry, it's, you know, you're, you're putting yourself at risk because, you know, some people may not like what you have to say. It's, it's just like being an artist, being a comedian, like telling your, like telling your story is, it's not easy. It's not easy. And I found it to where now as I've evolved musically, the more vulnerable I am, the more I'm able to relate to others. So it's like, there's literally no restraint as far as like what I talk about, because I know even if it's just one other person that understands like what I'm going through, like if I can reach that one person, like I feel like I've done my job and just being as vulnerable as possible because it's like when you hold back, sometimes people can tell like, okay, like, like it's not as authentic. And I feel like, being an artist and having that vulnerability like that adds to your authenticity and there's so many well I think that's kind of up for debate now because there's there's certain artists now where like they're just like hopping on a trend or just doing like what's hot and you don't see the authenticity like the authenticity the authenticity excuse me is, is missing because it's like they're not being their truest selves so for me, like my my job is to be as vulnerable as possible. I go, I feel like I go through these experiences, these <laughs> these crazy things, um, just to be able to share like my my testimony, like with the world, because I know there's somebody out there who has gone through what I've gone through. Uh, for example, with with Mary J. Blige, she's one of my biggest inspirations. And if she wasn't as transparent on my life, like I think there would be there there wouldn't be a lot of women living right now because she was able to be a voice for the voiceless, and and I took and I I admire that so much about Mary. And for me, like, I wanted to be able to do that with my own music. So, and, and that requires being vulnerable. That requires being transparent, unapologetic, and not being afraid to, to say, like, oh, like, what if, what if they think this about me? Like, I learned very early on that it doesn't matter. Like, for example, now, where we live, in, we're living in this, like, social media age where, to be honest, like, Sometimes I get anxiety about things that I post. Like it's weird. It's weird because in a song, I can say whatever. <laughs> I can say whatever I want. But like with a post, I don't know. Like it's it, it's it's different. But I think it also depends on the intention too. Like if my like my f- intention is to always just sh- like just share what's from my heart, and anything otherwise is. You know, it's not gonna. It's not gonna be. It's not gonna hit as hard as what I feel. You know, is is the most like intentional and transparent. Right. On on the on the social media front, one of the things that I realized is that if especially for independent artists, it seems as though they have to do things outside of just the music yeah. to, to to build an audience, right? It's not just I'm sharing music with the world. It's I have to I have to share memes. I have to get on I have to like um put my own twist on trends. You have to almost be um you have to build this brand outside of just your musical abilities. And I always wonder like what does that do for an artist? Like does it do you feel like it <clears throat> it starts to strip you of your um, of some of your uh, creativity and, or even maybe just some of your focus on the actual music because you have to focus on building this brand around the music? That's such a good question because um, I was actually asking that myself <laughs> because mm. now it's, 
people are invested not just in the music but like in the personality like as a whole like for example like yep. with with cardi b every yep. like because of her you know her um her honesty like her brashness like people like gravitated towards that and years ago like you wouldn't even I guess because of social media, but you wouldn't even know like what that person was doing on a daily. Like you would just right. hear like Tony Braxton like coming out with a new with a new album, and it's just like oh my god, it was like this huge phenomena. But now it's shifted to where it's like if you're not posting like six times a day, or if you you know you're not on like every single different platform, sometimes it gets overwhelming. Um, mm. I'll be honest, like it does. I, in some in some points, it does take away from the creativity a little bit because, you know, you're so focused on, like, algorithms and Facebook ads and literally just, like, being, like, consistent. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it can expand your creativity where it's, like, you're not limiting yourself to just, like, one thing. Right. Um, what I've learned is, like, to never be, like, limitless because I love music, but I also love hair. I love doing hair. I love natural hair. Um, I love to cook. <laughs> so, and and I've learned um, through like doing like different polls and stuff, like what people are, are interested in. And funny enough, they're like they want to see more of me like doing like cooking lives. I'm just like, wow. <laughs> so, you know, it, it does get overwhelming, mm-hmm. but I think. Um, you know that's that's the name of the game now. It's it's tough. Um, it, it adds another layer to being an artist because it's you know it's all about your brand. Like you are your brand, but it's like now there's so many different tiers as far as like content, as far as um, your personality, because right. now people don't just buy the music; they buy the personality. So. Right. It's 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 yeah. a lot now. It's it's a lot more nuanced than before, but it's it can it can get overwhelming. But I think as long as you have that foundation of intention and just mm-hmm. doing what what's true to you and not just what you know somebody suggests, I think like yeah. that's that that's what matters. Like as long as you're intentional about what you do, not just doing things because you want it to go viral. Like, I hate that. <laughs> like, I, like, that yeah. gets me so much because the most random things will get, like, for example, yeah. um, now that I'm on TikTok, I mm-hmm. um, I saw Tony Braxton's, like, video and I did, like, a response because I was so mad that she didn't know the words. <laughs> so, uh, uh, to cuff it. So, I did, like, a remix and I was like, if Tony did the cuff it challenge, and I just posted it at like midnight on a Saturday night. And then literally like the next day I got so many notifications, people like commenting, like it was mm-hmm. wild, but like you, you can't yeah. predict that. You just stay true to yourself, you know, and, and do, do what, like do what fulfills you at the end of the right. day. No, that's real. And I, I, I agree with you. Like there's a, there's like this careful balance that people sometimes don't always get right where yeah. you're you're like this trend is going on i'm just gonna hop on this trend but it, it's so off brand it's so far away from what your actual core is yeah. that it that people can sniff out the, the intention and the the authenticity because like people aren't stupid right and there's yeah there's there's a reason why for instance you, you mentioned mary j blige like her music really connects with people because the people that have gone through it know it when they hear it yeah. right and i think that's that's maybe like the balance that people don't get right but what i'm always curious about and it's and it i i don't know the i don't know like the science behind it the sweet science behind this and maybe there's a machine working behind the scenes that I, i'm not privy to but i'm always interested when an artist that doesn't do the trends that doesn't go along with um with the social media ups and downs when they can disappear for two years 
drop an album <laughs> and it goes crazy. Yeah. And I'm like, how do they how does it how do they maintain relevance? And I'm wondering from your perspective if you have any thoughts on on why that actually works for some people. Like obviously, like some of the most notable ones, Kendrick, of course. Kendrick, just yeah. going off in that. J. Cole goes goes um zero dark thirty, don't see him anymore for like two years and then he pops up. Um, <laughs> even even SZA to some degree, right? Like SZA wasn't dropping music consistently, but she yeah. drops SOS and to the moon, Number right? One, Billboard since I think she's like the first uh, black female artist um, since 1993 to have her number her album number one for like four weeks now. Crazy, <sighs> crazy, crazy, and. She it wasn't like her name was constantly buzzing. And I wonder if it's a my only guess is that this is maybe just a quality thing. Like mm-hmm. when the music is <clears throat> excuse me. When the music is is quality or the, the artist has a track record of quality, yeah, they can wait 10 years to drop an album and people will still uh, be looking for it, especially because maybe it's the contrast of like there's so much bad music yeah. that when Solange, who you don't hear from a lot, or SZA, who you don't hear from a lot, drops an album, you're like, wait a minute, I'm putting these other artists on the back burner. I'm 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 engaging with this right now. But I don't know. What do you think? You know, I I completely agree. I, I feel like those those artists, like they have I kind of envy them, but like <laughs> they have such yeah. a solid like following where it's just like no matter if they pull like if they release something like two years from now, five years from now, like they have like those dedicated fans. It's a lot harder for I'm gonna be honest, like it's it's a lot harder for independent artists to have that same um buoyancy, but it's I feel like it's because, you know, they're they're bigger artists, so like they have like a stronger fan base, but I feel like being an independent artist is a lot tougher because you're essentially you're not only competing with yourself, but you're competing with like the those those bigger artists, like those major artists. Because for example, say if if I release a, a single on Friday, like this Friday, and all of a sudden, um, Normani, like sh- mm-hmm. she comes out with a, a single that same day, M- nine times out of ten, it's all going to be about Normani. <laughs> it's all going to mm-hmm. be about Normani. So it's like sometimes you kind of get lost in the sauce being an independent artist, but um, that's why it's like it's important to not like jump on trends so much and 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 I guess another trend that I that I've heard about was like oh you gotta like release a song every week and I'm like that's exhausting because there was there was another um somebody tweeted this they said would you rather listen to an album where they said that the artist took like eight years to make versus an album that the artists said they took only like three weeks to make. Mm-hmm. And most of the people, they they would choose the the album that took like eight years to make because of the the journey and the process and appreciating like the process. So I feel like the real fans and like the real supporters, like they like no matter how long you take, like they will rock with you. Yeah. No matter what. Um I just who whatever independent artist is listening now, like I would just say, don't get discouraged where it's like that people are pressuring you to like drop things every single day or like, you know, drop a new album like every two weeks. It's just like, come on, you, everyone has their own like unique timeline. Yeah. So it's, it's all about, you know, taking time for yourself taking time to experience life, to enjoy life so that you can have those inspirations and not be so confined to, okay, when is, you know, when is going to be my next this, my next that? Like, just enjoy the moment. 
you know i would say don't take too long though <laughs> but and <laughs> i'm also telling myself this too but i think when you feel like you're that's the that's the beauty of being an independent artist too like you don't have like the labels like giving you specific deadlines like oh like right. this album has to be pitched by this specific time like we're on our own timeline we're on god's timeline because we may complete a whole project but then you know things happen and then you know it has to be pushed so right. you know just just embrace the journey i would say just embrace the journey and you know when you feel like it's right for you like release it like don't feel right. pressured because of you know major artists or because of what other uh, another artist is doing like everyone's on their own path like stick to your own path absolutely yeah and I think that's I think that's solid advice because you know comparison being a thief of joy you yeah. see these artists that are producing what you might deem as like highly engineered highly produced music every single week but you know little do you know they have an entire team behind them and it's as an indie funny. artist as an indie artist um you know, usually it's you're you're kind of a you know one man band, right? Yeah. And you're you're trying to you're trying to work off of your own momentum. I can I can talk like even specifically like building um, this podcast. Like it's it's interesting when you have to have the mindset of nothing moves unless you move it. Yeah. Right. And it's such a like I I, I felt like this journey into entrepreneurship is this like super introspective look at yourself and it exposes like some of the some of the holes in your own um in your own thinking in your own like it, even maybe some of the, like your past um trauma yeah it, it, it really, a lot of that <laughs> right it, it, it really like excavates all of these things and i've started to to really appreciate the people that can get up every single day and see like a a small amount of progress every single day. Yeah. And um, from your perspective as an indie artist, how are you managing that, the day-to-day -day motivation? So the way that I'm managing the day-to-day -day motivation, um, I would say definitely setting a routine, mm -hmm. uh, waking up, like it's, it's a new year. <laughs> so, you know, incorporating... Right new habits, but definitely waking up earlier, um, setting an intention for the day, mm. um, and, and just setting, uh, a, like having a positive mindset. Because yeah. if you, you're waking up like dreading the day already, your day's already right. done. The day's over. Right. So right. just literally having that routine, starting my day with prayer first and foremost, mm -hmm. because without without the lord like i would not have these gifts at all so just mm -hmm. spending that time with him yep. because we always tend to like as soon as we wake up like look on social media and seeing what's happening but it's like that it it muddles it muddles your mind a lot and you want to be able to wake up with a fresh clear mind um so that way it um it incites that creativity and that motivation so on a day to day just having that routine waking up starting with prayer um, and then uh, journaling. Like e I, mm -hmm. I had a gratitude journal. So mm -hmm. just like writing what I'm grateful for, like for the, for the day before, or like what do I look forward to doing like for the rest of the day? And yep. then that, and then also listening to some good music just to right. you know, get that energy going, working out and then, and then, you know, getting to the grind, but having that set time for yourself before the hustle and bustle because mm -hmm. another thing that happens with artists is, is burnout it's, yeah. it's like we're you know constantly doing this posting content doing this all of this and then it's like we don't have that time to just like be still because yeah. once you're still like that's when the ideas flow that's when the inspiration comes and you're able to be more productive and be more efficient yeah I agree. And I, I think we shouldn't shame ourselves or we should be a little bit kinder to ourselves when maybe not everyone needs to, not everybody feels like they have the capacity to work 18 hours a day, 
But there are some people that have that energy to yeah. do that. Especially and when you do what you love. Like, you can <laughs> just go. Right. You can just go, right? Some people can work that 18 hours. But some people need to work a solid nine hours of total productivity and then take their mind off of it to refresh. And yeah. it makes you, it actually makes you more productive over the long haul. Um, something you mentioned about the speed in which we put out music. Mm-hmm. Again, speaking from a layman, right? If you were, if you were to talk to someone like myself about why it's challenging to come out with music every single week, right? To or even every single two every two weeks, right? Even even mm-hmm. making a new track biweekly, an original song biweekly. What are some of the behind the scenes stuff that people don't understand about the process of making music and why it sometimes can be, it could take some time? Yeah, I would definitely say not having like that like team and like still being able to build a team because I, I have an engineer, um, I have a studio that I record at. So, uh, and shout out to Musicals. But it's people don't really understand like what goes into a song, like at all. It's not sometimes you can, you know, write a song in like 20 minutes and go record it, but sometimes like there's a process of rewriting. A lot of artists like don't do that. Like they just go and like record like what's on their mind. But then what I've learned, especially uh, with songwriting, like songwriting takes time. It, it, there's a lot of rewrites, it's a lot of drafts. It's like writing a book, essentially, like a mm-hmm. three minute book. So, you know, there's a, there's the process of rewriting. There's also overcoming self doubt, overcoming um, that like imposter syndrome um, that a lot of artists face. But I think yeah. what it comes down to is just having enough faith and just knowing that you were put on this earth for a reason and a specific unique purpose. But, um, I would say, yeah, there's a lot that goes in also funding, like funding everything yourself. That's another reason why um, with independent artists, sometimes it takes a little bit longer because we're literally funding everything ourselves from the videos to the studio time, to the, the marketing, to the PR, like we're all like funding that ourselves. So sometimes when, you know, people would get like upset to pay like two dollars for a song. I'm like, that literally like goes to us. That's why I'm I'm heavily like behind platforms like Bandcamp because Bandcamp you can pay what you want. Bandcamp you can support us directly. Like streaming, yep. to be honest, streaming doesn't pay. A lot. It's literally like pennies of the dollar. Right. So it's just people. People just need to understand like it. Like every song is its own process. And especially when you don't have like a huge team as of yet and like doing everything on your own is going to take a lot longer. But, you know, the process and the, the reward, like it's it's definitely worth the, the reward, but yeah. it's all about that process. Yeah. And I would say, like the the good thing about an artist like yourself is that if you're making people wait, it's for quality, right? It's not exactly. I'm not giving you I'm not giving you something like I recorded in my bathtub, right? It's <laughs> it's some real <laughs> it's some real stuff. Um, yeah. Speaking of which, I wanted to get into two tracks in particular that really okay. caught my attention. So, save us. Mm-hmm. Recorded in 2017. Yes. Great song. I listened to it. And I felt it. You then, I then realized you dropped a, uh, a live studio version of it yeah. in 2022. I 
heard that version, it hit so much deeper. Like it, it, it cut so much deeper when I heard it, um, in this like intimate live, live band. Um, and it's, it, it felt even, I know it was engineered and it was produced, but it was, it felt even more raw. And I don't know if you ever heard, um, Kendrick on To Pimp a Butterfly, that album he had, um, but prior to that album coming out, he released I, you know, I love myself. Oh, yeah. yeah. Released that track, right. On the album, it wasn't the, the studio cut. It was a live performance that he had in Compton of that song. And when he, when he recorded it there, there was like a fight that broke out there and he he kept all of that in right and <laughs> it was this like yeah it was crazy it was a fight that broke out and it was um he kind of like got the crowd back and then he spit an acapella verse right but there was something so like raw gut-wrenching like you felt every single intention from the song that mm. that he, he wanted to convey that sometimes will leak out of a studio version of it because it's so polished right and i wonder well first of all i'm curious as to what made you put out the live um, performance of this song uh five years after releasing it but also i'm curious like from an artist's perspective is that the hardest part of the recording process being able to take the soul and the rawness of this record of what your intention is and put it into this like very polished version of this song versus when you're maybe recording it in front of an audience like mm-hmm. you have a lot like they can see you you're moving around they can look at you in your eyes and feel the passion yeah oh wow um so for your first, for the first question, um, what made me want to re-release "Save Us" five years after was that every time I performed "Save Us," it it resonated so much with people, and I felt that like at that time, you know, just being like a new artist and well, I'm still a new, but like newer artist and like still understanding my voice still understanding my capabilities i i wanted to be able to give new life to save us especially because people still hadn't hadn't heard it at that time like i i put it out i think i put it out, put it out on cd baby and you know but every time i performed it people were just like oh my gosh like this like this song, like it stands the test of time. And it does because um, when I wrote it, I actually wrote it in 2014 around a time when um, the the girls um, were kidnapped in Nigeria. So like all of those emotions um, were poured out like in that song. Like I literally remember waking up in two, at 2 a.m. and hearing like a woman's voice and I had to like hurry up and like grab my pen and just like write down everything that she was saying. But what was so special about uh, recording the live version of Save Us was like I mentioned to give it new life. And within those five years, I had I had experienced so much, you know, whether it's through like love, heartbreak, just my own internal struggles, um, my like my own, like it's as far as like career, just a lot of just dissonance and just a lot of things happening. So I carried that energy within the live uh, recording. And you see that like within the video, like it's, it's like the energy is a lot more evolved and I was just able to give it new breath literally because I'm like, I'm at a different point in my life where I understood the lyrics a lot more given what I've been through over those five years. So like it, it's like, it, it was like 
fine wine. Like it just aged so well because when I first when I first recorded it, I just wanted to get my feelings out. And and I, I even spent some time like rewriting it too, because originally it was why don't you save us? The hook was why don't you save us? But um and special thanks to Billy Simon who was able to help me ask that that deeper question, like who's gonna save us? So that's why rewriting is definitely important. <laughs> but um, f- yeah, five years later, just having that array of emotions and just all of the things that I experienced on my journey, both you know within my daily life and in in the music business, I had a bigger, like a greater perspective on like what I wanted to say in that moment. Yeah, no, for sure. And to the second part, like I, I've, I've watched, uh, I've watched like Summer Walker's um, Tiny Desk before I heard some of the, the actual like studio performances mm-hmm. that she had on the album. And it, and without failure, it really does feel like some like the live performances is is almost like the the most authentic version of that song. Absolutely. And you know, I, I is it is it difficult for you as an artist to provide that level of uh, passion and connection and rawness in this polished in a polished track? Like, is that a, is that a challenge that you, that you find as an artist? Um, I don't really find it as much as a challenge because for me, like the, having that polished product, like it's a lot of takes, it's a lot of, (laughs) a a, a lot of redos, but I think Mm -hmm. like we talked about before, like as long as the intention is consistent, Mm -hmm. like that's, that's the key. So my intention when I um, when I first recorded Save Us was to share a testimony, right? Mm-hmm. And and I also think vocally I was able to a- appreciate like five years later like the growth with, mm. within my voice, and also too the and like I said like keeping that intention the same. Yeah. So for both the for both the 2017 version and the live version, the intention is still the same. But like like you mentioned, like the rawness and yeah. the and just like the realness, like that's why I love like live performances <laughs> because you yeah. just never know what could happen. Yeah. Um, I there there were other takes where like I literally like broke like I almost broke down crying because. Mm. Like in that moment, like the lyrics hit me so much, yeah. And you know, and and that and that's the beauty of like live record, like live recording, because right. you just never know what could happen. Even even when you do takes with live performances, like not every take is the same. Right. So there's always something different about each take. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, no matter how polished it is, like there's always going to be something different, something special. Um, even if there's like a note that I cracked on, it's like, no, keep that. And I'm just like, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's all about uh, the intention at the end of the day. Yeah. I saw that. That reminded me. I watched um, Jesse J perform overseas um, on YouTube and she was singing um, I Will Always Love You by uh, Whitney Houston. Mm. And as she's singing it i mean she is blowing the roof off of this place i mean she is i I didn't know her like that as an artist i just saw that she did a cut i was looking for covers like i i'll randomly just start looking at covers um of songs and i want to see like who out here can really you know step up to the challenge of a whitney houston song and i watched this jesse j song and I'm, i'm jesse j uh cover and she absolutely destroys it, right? Yeah, but she's, the thing she's another the- like powerhouse. Oh yeah, she's a super powerhouse. And yeah. as she's singing, she is crying. And I'm like, this is this is the difference between I won't name any artists, 
because I hope they'll be on my podcast at some point. But some <laughs> artists, <laughs> some artists, you feel, even though their voice might not be as powerful, and some artists have incredible, powerful, incredibly powerful voices, but you just don't feel it. Like yeah. it just doesn't connect, you know. Um, switching gears though to another song of yours, Hideaway. Now, mm-hmm. Hideaway came out in 2022 right yeah and i thought it was interesting because the way that i listened to your discography was in chronological order oh wow (laughs) so so i listened to you like have this like super like i i I see the 90s r&b influence right Mm -hmm. all the way up to hideaway which as i was listening to it i thought that my, I, I thought the app closed. I was like, "Wait a minute, hold on." <laughs> okay, wait. Oh, stop! The song is less than two minutes. I didn't even, think, I didn't even think you would you would make a track like that, and it made me think of, um, one, the the motivation and inspiration behind the song, but also number two, like the difference in the process for mm. a song like, let's say, for instance, Legacy which is a full three and a half, four minute song versus a song mm-hmm. like this that's shorter. Like, are th- is, is, is a track like this more difficult to make? Or is my assumption that just because it's shorter, it's easier? Hmm. Um, I would say that it was a lot more challenging to do, honestly, because doing like a, a minute 40 song, like I remember talking with my, uh, my engineer and he was just like, um, do you want to add like a few more bars to it? To it, like I can like extend it. I'm like, no. Like I want to keep it <laughs> how it is. Um, I would say on one on one end of the spectrum, it's like it's like there's this debate where people's like attention spans are shorter. So it's mm-hmm. like you know, the shorter the song, the more like you can capture attention, and then also like I guess for streaming purposes, where it's like. You, people go back and like listen to it like a lot more, yep. but on the other end of the spectrum, it's challenging myself to like get my point across like mm. <laughs> even faster. Mm. Um, because a lot of times, like I would, I, I could do like an eight minute song and just go, but church oh, you know what? Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> like, what is it? Um, they used to have the like the twelve inch LP version. Like, I could oh, I would love to do that but i think it was definitely a challenge for me to um to do hideaway but it it allowed me to you know diversify myself because yeah. you know some people prefer shorter songs now some people like they they don't want to sit and listen to four minute songs unfortunately like that, that's just how it is like i've i've seen the debates back and forth right but i think for me like as long as I was able to still tell my story and also like add like a bit of an edge because Hideaway um, and shout out to Fist Tracks, like he, like the the vibe of the song was just very like, it was, it was like a very, like I, I would describe Hideaway as like an audible like vacation, like an audible escape. So like you're just like escaping and you're able to like have that moment with like that special someone, but it could be just for just for a little bit, just for thirty minutes, just for one night, you know. And time is time is fleeting, so right. you know that's how I was like, you know, let me just try something different and um, and do that. And also shout out to Chris Hunt um, who did Legacy and the entire Recovery and Discovery EP because having that body of work. Um, for me, it like it established me as an artist and allowed me to really just be open with like how I wanted to tell my story. So for me, you know, I have I have levels. Like there there will be times where I have three minute songs. There will be times where I have songs that are just as long as interludes. <laughs> like, I don't want to like limit myself. So. But as long as I'm able to tell my story and like get people in and get people invested, like that's 
that's how I know it's it's a done deal. I when I heard Hideaway, uh, and and your point is is well taken because I listened to Hideaway a few times because it was such like it was like um almost like a Costco sample. I went back a few times <laughs> just like in the block, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. I, I I listened to it a few times, and the imagery that I have had in my head was like. Oh, I could see this being played at like a boat party or something, right? Like I can see this track just feels like a song that I would hear out. Yeah. And um it was it was interesting to see like your I almost felt like I was like listening to your like almost like a um like a like an autobiography. I was almost listening to it because it was because I listened to it in chronological order and I'm seeing like your your growth as an artist and you're right like even going back to save us the the live session i can hear the distinct difference in 2022 versus 2017 you can hear the growth um in your vocals and it it brings me to one of my last questions for you is as an artist where would you like to see yourself grow next like what what do you what what's the new experience for you as an artist that that you're you're exploring now? Uh, where I would like to see myself grow next as an artist is just evolving, continuing to evolve musically. Um, I want to explore other genres. Um, for example, I want to get back to my roots. I recorded. I was featured on a song um, called Ali uh, last year. Mm -hmm. And being able to speak like my like my native, well, yeah. well like one of my native languages, um, yeah. Haitian Creole, and just yeah, to pay yeah. homage to um, to my ethnicity was right. just remarkable. And it was a challenge for me too, because I had to literally like step out my comfort zone um, to be able to do that. Because singing in a different language, like you still feel the emotion. But mm -hmm. being able to like properly, you know, like speak the like properly speak the language because I being born here like it's different. Yeah, being right. being being a Haitian American versus just being like being born in Haiti like it's totally yeah. different. So yeah. and also like having that background in R and B, so adding those elements. Um, to a, a compa song like I, I definitely want to do more of that yeah. also um, some other genres like even like country um, rock because I listen to mm. everything I listen yeah. to everything jazz um, I, mm. I study Ella Fitzgerald Sarah Vaughn you know all the um, Billy Holiday like I've I've studied those, those women so being able to expand my um my range as far as music and genres i definitely want to do that and also even dance now you see beyonce came out with a whole progressive dance yeah. album like she she gave all of us girls like the the green light to do it too like right. look, like don't ever like limit yourself but um i also see myself like writing for other artists definitely um building my catalog getting yep. into sync licensing, like hearing my music finally in like TV shows mm. and films. Uh, I know the best man um, chapters just, just was just released, but I was just like, I wish mm. it <laughs> like, would have been that. But you know, for yeah. 2023, I'm claiming, yeah. you know, it's a new year. So I'm claiming, you know, more placements, um, more collaborations um, especially with um, hip hop artists, because I do yeah. have that like that soulful background and everything. Also, yeah. writing for other gospel artists because I have gospel roots. I grew up in a church, so just just doing more of that and um, just maximizing my creativity and just just elevating to a higher level and just doing what I love like consistently and continuously and expanding my reach and having p new ears hear my music and hear my story i see nothing but great things in your future um i also thought about you absolutely tearing up a jazz cover like i could absolutely <laughs> tear that up um uh well i appreciate you so much for coming on the show 
Um, thank you, Jane. Thank you. <laughs> I, um, I do have one final question that I'm going to ask every single guest, and mm-hmm. that is, Linda Starr, what is a quote that you personally live by? <sighs> a quote that I personally live by. Everybody has that reaction, too. Like, yeah, <laughs> I'm so bad at quotes because I always like me. <laughs> but I think, um, especially as we prepare for um, honoring the life of Dr. King, mm-hmm. um, he has a quote that that says, uh, "Faith is taking the first step, even when you don't see the full staircase." And mm-hmm. I feel, and now being being older because being older like i like that resonates with me so much now because having faith like you you literally do not know when the next paycheck is gonna come like mm-hmm. you don't know when your song is gonna take off you you never know when the next opportunity is gonna come so just having that foundation of faith um continuing on and just literally like doing doing your heart's passion and just fulfilling that literally is like what keeps me grounded like having that faith and you know not like this fear whole fear of the unknown you know the unknown is scary but it's also beautiful because you know it it allows for growth and allows for expansion and evolution so just Take that step, take that leap of faith, and you know you never know, you know what's on the other side. 